South Africa's Commission of Inquiry into long-running corruption when Mr. Jacob Zuma was in office has handed over the first part of its final report to President Cyril Ramaphosa. Over four years, the commission heard from over 300 witnesses and it gathered over 1.7 million pages of documentary evidence submitted to it as these witnesses detailed their accounts of corruption, influence peddling and intimidation. CGTN's Yoli Sanjamela has the details. Almost four years to the day since the Commission of Inquiry into State Capture started, Chairperson Judge Raymond Zondo handed the first of three reports to President Cyril Ramaphosa. The first part of the report is divided into three volumes. The first volume deals with corruption at the country's national airline, the South African Airways. It also targets the findings on the Gupta family who owned the New Age newspaper. The New Age newspaper was allegedly used to secure advertising and sponsorship from the state-owned government communication and information system. The Guptas are a wealthy family with origins from India. The family have been accused of meddling in state matters during former President Jacob Zuma's presidency. The third volume deals with the capture of the South African Revenue Services. Zuma set up the commission himself in 2018 after an order from the High Court in Pretoria. Both Zuma and Ramaphosa testified at the commission. This is what I would call a defining moment in our country's effort to definitely end the era of state capture and to restore the integrity, the credibility, and the capability of our institutions, but more importantly, our government. The Commission of Inquiry heard testimony from hundreds of witnesses who spoke out about corruption during former President Zuma's two terms between 2009 and 2019. The most, I said, devastating and lasting cost of state capture and corruption is the effect on the confidence of the people of South Africa in the leaders and the officials in whom they place great trust and responsibility. State capture has damaged people's confidence in the rule of law, in public institutions, in law enforcement agencies, and even to some extent in the democratic process. That is what makes the work of this commission so essential. Two more installments of the report are expected before those implicated are likely to be prosecuted. Acting Chief Justice Raymond Zondo stated that the second part of the report will be available at the end of January, while the third and last installment of the report will be presented at the end of February. President Romaposa has indicated that he will step aside from the implementation of the Zondo Commission recommendations should he be implicated in allegations of state capture. Julius and Jomana for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. All right, then, so the first report is out, all near 800 pages of it. It makes a very interesting reading. Let's see exactly what this means for South Africa. Milton Nkosi is a senior research fellow at the think tank Afrasid. He joins us now live on the program. Um, Milton, thank you very much for your time this evening. Much appreciated. What is it that stood out for you um, in this report? Because it mostly covers SAA, but what, what are the standout points for you? I think the report is uh, not surprising, but uh, shocking nevertheless, uh, given the detailed findings and serious findings against state-owned enterprises such as South African Airways and the South African Revenue Services, uh, known locally as SAA and SARS. It found that the chairman, the former chairman of SAA, Ms. Dudumieni, who is very close to the former president, Jacob Zuma, um, needs to be, it is recommending that she needs to be charged with uh, corruption and fraud for her role in the shenanigans within South African Airways and the subsidiary companies. And then it is also found that the Gupta linked uh, newspaper, which was known as the New Age, uh, also uh, uh, milked the uh, government 
entities. Uh, it also uh, condemned the former SARS commissioner, Tom Moyani. So um, not surprising, but uh, still pretty much damning on the former president and his allies. For instance, uh, he's uh, the spokesperson for the Jacob Zuma Foundation, Mzwanele Manyi, um, has already responded by saying he is used as a scapegoat because he supports uh, Jacob Zuma. So um, now South Africans are waiting for the implementation of those recommendations. In other words, they want uh, remedial action they want to see the prosecuting authority, the NPA, National Prosecuting Authority, to start now bringing all these cases uh, to court. But the benchmark, as you would know, it's much higher in a court of law than it is in a commission of inquiry to prove beyond reasonable doubt that those implicated or alleged to have uh, conducted themselves uh, uh, in wrongdoing uh, need to be proved uh, guilty beyond reasonable doubt. So that's right. the complexity and the process that is expected to be implemented uh, following the handing over of the 874 page uh, report to President Cyril Ramaphosa. This is the first part of the report. It will come in three parts. And this first part uh, has three volumes. So there's quite a lot to go through. Uh, uh, even for the president himself. Indeed, uh, some of us will clearly not be sleeping as we try and read through this entire document. But let's let's just try and get a sense of where the timelines work here, because as I understand it, the president says he's going to submit um, a plan of recommendations to parliament in June after he's gotten the other two reports. Uh, but at the same time, this first part of the report essentially recommends, as you said, uh, that the police and the National Prosecuting Authority do probe the former SAA chair for, and I'm quoting them here, causing sustained damage to the national airline. So can that probe and that investigation start before the president makes his recommendations to parliament in June? Oh, yes, indeed. There's nothing that is stopping the investigating arm of the prosecuting authority to uh, begin in earnest with its work. And actually, they hadn't been waiting for the report. The president was waiting for the report. They can go on with, as long as they have enough of evidence to present to a court of law um, and, and they are prepared to start with the case. Um, uh, they can go ahead. Uh, they have enough information now to try and put together uh, winnable cases, especially the lower hanging fruit where there's uh, enough evidence for them to proceed. President Ramaphosa is correct in that he, as the executive head, will have to present it to parliament before he implements the recommendations that I expected from his desk. Right, and of course there are, what, 1,400 or so individuals who have been implicated in this. Um, but, but just walk us through the, the, the timelines for the submission of the other reports, because I know there's one that's due at the end of January and then another at the end, due at the end of February. And the one due at the end of this month focuses mostly on utilities, ESCOM, Transnet, and the arms manufacturer, uh, Denel. Uh, should we expect more of the same here, things that we already knew that were already in the public domain, but perhaps in just a bit more detail? Yes, indeed. Uh, in South African uh, society, we've had so much about the state capture, about the Guptas and their relationship with President Zuma and his uh, allies. Uh, in fact, that has split the ANC down the middle now. Um, and this year is the ANC elective conference towards uh, the end of the year where Cyril Ramaphosa will be seeking a second term as a head of the governing party. But um, what has happened is that those who support former President Jacob Zuma are adamant that this is a politically motivated uh, investigation. They think that President Zuma has done no wrong whatsoever. He's being persecuted because of his policies uh, towards the economic trajectory of South Africa. So the second uh, part of the report, which is expected end of this month, uh, and then there is the last part, which is expected end of February. So we will have to see once the president has gone through all those uh, parts 
of the state capture report by the deputy uh, uh, justice uh, zondo uh, whether they will be implemented in full south africans have lost faith in a way in the uh, implementation phase there have been many other commissions of inquiry there was a specific one for the south african revenue services sars uh, the nugent report came out and uh, as far as the public is concerned very little came out of it in terms of prosecutions and convictions so so there is some little bit of hope that uh, perhaps after the Zondo report uh, has fully been handed over, then uh, we'll start to see people wearing orange overalls for defrauding the state. Uh, one last question for you, Milton. Um, uh, where does this leave the ANC? Is this perhaps a critical juncture in the road uh, for the party in terms of how it deals with corruption? Because you look at this report and it just details section after section where the party consistently failed in safeguarding or being an efficient steward of public resources. In fact, the report's uh, finding says that the ANC abused the procurement uh, processes of government uh, for its own benefit. So, uh, Pule Mabe, who speaks on behalf of the ANC, has already issued a statement saying that the ANC will follow the recommendations. Of course, he has no choice because he reports within the ANC to President Ramaphosa, the head of the party, and Cyril Ramaphosa is the president who actually is receiving the report and expecting to implement it on behalf of the executive. All right, we'll leave it there for the time being. Milton Nkosi, Senior Research Fellow at AFRICID, thank you very much for your time.